Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Vivian Schiller, and I'm the executive director of Aspen Digital, a program of the Aspen Institute. We're really glad you could be with us today. The New York Times bestseller list can often seem to be a mirror of the national psyche. And as such, this year, it seems to reflect a nation going through an awakening on matters of race. Books written by people of color and about matters of race and racism have filled those lists, both fiction and nonfiction. That's the good news. Sadly, the publishing industry does not necessarily always reflect that reality. The recent Twitter protests, hashtag publishing paid me, exposed the major pay disparity in the industry between black and non-black authors. There are few people of color who serve as publishing staff or literary agents, and even fewer who operate at decision-making levels. And for those who are published, sometimes the marketing exposure can be suboptimal. And this, as, and this year of national reckoning on racism, we're gonna take a look at the book industry, the book publishing industry, and whether it can bring more racial diversity to the field. This is part of our Changing the Narrative series, uh, which that looks at issues of race through the media. We had one program on the news media, and we have upcoming another program about the enter entertainment industry. We explore the challenges, but importantly, we also look at the new possibilities, in this case, for employing and publishing more books by and about people of color. So I'm about to introduce our panel and then our moderator for today. But before I do, just a reminder, um, this is a live program. Um, you are going to hear a conversation uh, among our moderator and our fantastic panelists. But then later in the hour, we're going to take your questions. So if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you can see a little button that says Q&A. At any time starting now, you can click on that button and enter your question. We would ask uh, that you add your name and your affiliation if you're comfortable doing so. It just uh, adds a little more uh, texture to and context for the questions. We will then curate those questions and provide those to um, our wonderful moderator who will then pose them to our panelists. So again, anytime, just click on it starting, starting now. Uh, now let me int uh, introduce our panelists and so we can get started. Uh, we have with us uh, Regina Brooks, the founder and president of Serendipity Literary Agency based in Brooklyn. Her agent has represented and established a diverse base of award-winning clients in adult and young adult fiction, nonfiction, and children's literature. N N Nicole Dennis Ben is the author of Here Comes the Sun, a New York Times notable book of the year and a 2017 Lambda Literary Award winner. Her best-selling second novel, Patsy, is a 2020 Lambda Literary Award winner, a New York Times Editor's Choice, a Financial Times Critic Choice, a Stonewall Book Awards Honor Book, and on countless um, best book of the year lists. Lisa Luc Lucas has been the Executive Director of the National Book Foundation and is the incoming Senior Vice President and Publisher of Pantheon and Shokin Books. Prior to joining the foundation, Lisa served as the publisher of Guernica, a nonprofit online magazine focusing on writing that explores the intersection of arts and politics with an international and diverse focus. We have with us also Errol McDonald, the Vice President and Executive Editor in the Knopf Doubleday Division of Penguin Random House, where he has worked in various editorial capacities for more than three decades. Among the distinguished authors he has published are Jack Henry Abbott, James Baldwin, Count Basie, Atala Calvino, Henry Louis Gates, Fran Leibowitz, Toni Morrison, uh, and many, many more. And finally, I'm so pleased to introduce my colleague and the moderator for today, Adrienne Broder. She is the uh, head of executive director of Aspen Words. Uh, she is also the author of the memoir Wild Game, which is in development for a film. During her 15 years in the publishing industry, Adrienne founded the liter a literary magazine with filmmaker Francis Ford Coppola, was an acquiring editor at Harcourt and HMH Books, and served as a judge for the National Book Awards, among other literary contests. She's been published far and wide in magazines. She's been with Aspen since 2013. Aspen Words is a literary arts nonprofit program of the Aspen Institute, which includes the Aspen Words Literary Prize. We are so pleased to have you with us, Adrian, my beloved colleague. And so I turn it over to you and to the other panelists. 
Thank you so much, Vivian, for that introduction. And thank you to the Aspen Words and Aspen Digital teams for hosting this event. And to all of you, our panelists, and to all of you who are Zooming in today for your interest in changing the narrative, something long overdue in the publishing industry. As an FYI to all of you watching, this group met yesterday um, to have a little pre-game conversation. And we decided that as much as possible, um, we'd like to make this a forward-thinking, solution-driven conversation. So in other words, while we're not going to sugarcoat any of the facts or gloss over the historical situations surrounding the racial inequalities that exist in publishing, we're, not, we're also not going to spend too much time restating and rehashing the obvious. The obvious being, one, <laughs> the publishing industry has always been predominantly white, 76%, according to a recent survey, and that figure skews higher when it comes to the highest positions in the industry. And two, that a, as a result of that power structure and the fact that white people have been the primary arbiters of literary culture, black writers and other writers of color have had a harder time getting published. There are, of course, other issues, cultural appropriation, disparities in pay that Vivian mentioned in the um, What Publishing Paid Me uh, Twitter, Twitter protest. Um, so we are going to have lots and lots to talk about. Uh, but before we dive into the conversation, it feels important to acknowledge that I am a white woman, and I'm sure have blind spots in terms of my own privilege, and I'm working hard to become more self-aware as we all need to do at this time. But with that, let's begin. Um, as all of us on this call know, we are lucky enough to work in one of the most fascinating, exciting, wonderful industries, publishing, the world of literature and storytelling and letters. And what I'd love to start with is sort of um, with you talking about what drew you to the literary world and what the publishing industry needs to do now to open up opportunities to people of color. And Regina, I thought we'd start with you and maybe you'd be able to talk a little bit about your experience at Howard University Press Book Publishing Institute. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be on this panel. Um, you know, when I think about the genesis of how I started in publishing, it was very serendipitous. And I guess that's the name of my company, <laughs> Serendipity Literary Agency. Um, I have a background in engineering uh, as an aerospace engineer. And I had this summer off and I said, well, I was going to take this publishing program at Howard University. Uh, and it really changed my life and changed my world upside down. Uh, I've always had kind of a background interest, and I say background, but background interest in books. Uh, I was just uh, interviewed probably about a week ago, and I was trying to think like, gosh, Regina, you've always been a person who goes to the library. You've all, there was a library right around the corner from my house. And um, I realized that I asked my mom to go upstairs and she found this, um, it was a certificate that I had actually given James Baldwin, an award. <laughs> so I've always been a part of the publishing space or books, but I ended up at the Howard University Publishing Institute and that institute no longer exists today. I think it was almost 27 years ago. And that's how I was introduced to the publishing marketplace. As an engineer, I started out working for John Wiley and Sons and I started in sales and then Eventually, they moved me to New York and I became an editor. And I worked as an editor in the engineering disciplines, um, mechanical, chemical, electrical. But it's so funny because, again, just thinking back to the genesis, there are two people that I met at that publishing institute who are still in the business today. And one of them is a business partner now. So one was Marie Brown. She was a literary agent. Um, she and I have our own imprint called Open Lens now. Um, and also, I met Cheryl Hudson. She's a publisher with her husband, Wade, and they, again, still are in the business. And so there's something to be said about the longevity of being in the business as a Black person. There's also something to be said about the fundamentals that were learned at that publishing institute. Like I said, Howard University Publishing Institute no longer exists today, 
But when I think about what kind of things could the industry do to really bring more people into the business and also sustain them. And I think that it would be an awesome idea to um, reinvigorate that institute. There are still, there are other institutes that exist like the Denver Institute, Columbia I think has a program, also NYU. But I think that no, numerous publishers today are trying to figure out how do we get to the talent? How do we get to the talent? And right. there's no bigger and better way to do that than to um, have the Institute again. And, and I did read um, just today that in publishing perspectives that HarperCollins Echo, in partnership with Cynthia Dupree Sweeney, created a publishing diversity fellowship, which is new, I believe, as part of the uh, Columbia publishing course. But, you know, that's still, that's still a, a smaller a smaller organization than the one that you're talking about. It also really segues nicely to something Lisa was mentioning yesterday, which was really about the bounty of jobs in publishing that we don't really necessarily all know are there without some kind of education in the field, because I think most of us think writers, editors, okay, that's it. And do you want to talk at all about that, Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, <clears throat> I was joking yesterday when we had our little pre-call that if somebody had told me that a job like being a literary scout existed, I probably would have been a literary scout since it sounded like, you know, as a 28 year old, I was like, wait, what, what did I miss? But I think that it's a complicated industry. And I think I'm still learning, you know, I didn't start working at literary magazines until I was 33. And so I really came from outside of the industry, although I've been within it since then. And it was a real education and all the things that no one had told me. And I think that we have to be thinking about diversifying the industry, of course, with decision makers and executives and publishers and editors, but we also need to think about our marketing folks and think about our publicity folks and think about design and legal and HR and all of the things that actually go into and sales. Um, there are so many pieces. Every book, you know, you see the book and it has a colophon and a, an imprint uh, and it has a title of an author and you think, you know, whoa, this person made this book, but it takes an actual enormous team to make a lot of these books sing. And if you don't have diversity at every level, you know, you don't have the checks and balances that prevent embarrassing missteps from happening. You don't have a diversity of, you know, information about where uh, there are challenges, whether it's in HR, or it's in the blind spots are all throughout. And so I think that we do focus on the authors and on the editors. And I think that we have to be thinking really broadly about what an entire team that makes a book possible or an imprint possible or a publishing house possible or the agents representation, Regina is so important, right? You need people who understand the challenges. And so you have to really educate people about what books are. I think that sometimes I used to work in film and I think one of our jobs was to work with teenagers and they were all interested in becoming in film, becoming filmmakers. And I think the most important thing we did was to demystify what it looked like to articulate below the line jobs as well as what it meant to be a director or an editor or a producer, right? So that people really had an understanding of what was happening. And, and there's, we're very happy to sort of seem like we make magic. I think everyone who makes art is like, oh, my magical, you know, <laughs> art form that I work in and no one could ever figure out what we do. You know, and that all, you know, obscures, you know, that there are roles for people to fill and that there are job trajectories. And I think that, you know, where a parent of a child might not support them if they want to go be an author or go be an editor. They might really understand what it means to be in HR in a huge corporation or what it means to, to, to work in the arts with a law degree or whatever it is. I mean, I think that it goes from high to low. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about a job inside of a warehouse or you're talking about a job at the top, top, you know, thinking about operations or sales or marketing or what have you, I think that we really have to, you know, start educating people about what publishing and the whole literary field, including literary nonprofits, needs to look like for it to be equitable in some way and to be reflective of the society that we actually live in because we are telling those stories. And I think we think about only the art and the art is first, but there's so much that has to happen for that art to live. And we need to educate people about those as well, those roles. That's my thought on that. That's so important. And then maybe we can turn to the artist, <laughs> to Nicole, and um, ask you sort of what, what your career journey was like, and was it hard for you to find traction in the industry in the beginning, finding an agent, um, an editor, all that with your first novel? 
Um, definitely it was a challenge. And, you know, just to piggyback up what Lisa had just met, um, said, you know, this demystifying the industry. Um, I, had, I knew nothing about the industry. You know, um, I'm, I'm coming from a public health medical background. Um, and so, of course, as a, a first generation immigrant, you were told that that's what you ought to do. But yes, I knew I always wanted to be a writer. I didn't have any avenues whatsoever. Did not know any writers growing up, um, especially writers of color or black writers, period. So when I came to, um, to the US, and of course, after college and grad school, that was when I got into the whole, like, what, what is an MFA program and, you know, got into one. And was surprised that I was like, I'm one of two black students in that program. Um, long story short, we're told that getting agents were the hardest thing and thinking that that's actually the only hurdle that you have to jump through um, to get into the realm of publishing. And that's far from the truth. Um, as Lisa just mentioned, you know, you have the editors, you have the whole house, that you have to sell, all those things. Um, so it took me a while. Um, you know, I submitted that first book. Um, thought I got the right person. Thought I got somebody who was interested. That person ended up telling me um, to take out the Jamaican patois out of my book because a woman in Michigan would never read my books and understand what I'm talking about. And being a young writer, I thought that was the end all and be all. I thought that I had to do that in order to, to be successful. So I did. Um, and of course, reading my book, I, it didn't feel like mine. Luckily, I had a mentor, Marita Golden, and she was the head of um, Hearst and Wright, um, where I had a fellowship. And she told me, you know, Nicole, let this one go. You know, um, as a writer, it's going to be, it's a part of the game to get rejections. So go back to the drawing board, get on the, um, on the computer and just submit query letters to agents. So that's, in, that's what I ended up doing. I ended up actually writing a whole new book, actually, um, and resubmitting to agents. And so, of course, um, I went down an alphabetical order from Poets and Writers database. And, you know, um, a couple of weeks later, I got hits from three agents. And I was so happy that um, Julie Bear happened to be one of them with who I fell in love with. Because one thing I was looking... Um, that of course my mentor again very important to have mentors one thing that marita said to me is that you know what your agent is it's like a relationship you know a lot of young writers out there would latch on to the agent because oh you know that that's what you're told that you ought to get to be successful but it's important to have somebody who gets your work and especially as a black writer a black immigrant writer as well um tapping into very very dark issues um you know sexuality um all these things, you know, the person has to get it to sell the book well. And, you know, I had that, um, the luck of having that happen. You know, um, Julie sold my book. Um, but the thing is, the, not many publishing houses were latching on to it. Um, Here Comes the Sun was a hard sell. You know, um, you know in, 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 in fact, what the only publisher that latched on to the book was Katie um, Adams from um, Live Right, from Norton Live Right. Um, you know, because I was getting messages like, oh, it's too commercial or oh, we don't understand why a young black girl is bleaching her skin. Like, what is that, you know? And so I guess, again, you know, in terms of um, diversifying um, publishing, I feel like if I had other more, more, um, more black editors, perhaps, in houses um, who, who are looking at the work and say, oh, yeah, you know, we get that. We know, we understand the importance of tackling colorism, you know, um, or, ta or, or, or seeing the other side of this so-called paradise that people see but as oh Bob Marley and all these things, but I was actually getting deeper into the um, who we are behind the fantasy. And I feel like nobody got that except for one woman who happens to be white. And um, well two women who happen to be white. Um, but you know, so the also the it suggests the importance of allies as well. Um, but what one thing that happened in 2020 that I was really happy about, given that my foot is in the door, I got Patsy out, and people love Patsy was that, you know, Lisa is coming on now as, you know, uh, you know, here she is um, in her new position. There's um, Dana Kennedy and, uh, or, and there's, uh, or here, Errol McDonald is sitting here in this panel, Regina Brooks. And I felt like, you know, the young me did not know these people. You know, the young, the young Nicole coming out of the MFA program knew nothing about that. Uh, but now it's more, um, we're more in this realm where we're now here uh, on this level. Um, these individuals are now placed in, higher positions. And I interviewed Dana Kennedy two weeks ago for Zora magazine. And she said to me, you know, the change has to happen from the top. You know, um, yes, I know it has to trickle down, but the top is where it happens first. You know, and so I honestly believe that. And I'm so, I'm so happy that she's now sitting at that top and now looking at the little, um, you know, people, MFA persons, or even, I forget MFA, 
you're a writer coming into the game, you know, you could see, you, you could see yourself in on the page and know that you can do it as well. You can achieve that because there are people behind those closed doors who are also rooting for you. And right. so that's really where I'm coming from. Right. No, oh, thank you. And Errol, you've obviously been in the industry for some time, 40 years. Um, why has the industry been so very slow to diversify and what other initiatives need to be developed to sort of achieve greater inclusivity? Well, um, there's so much fake news out there about publishing in general and publishers have done such a lousy job accounting for and describing the industry that I don't know where to start. Let me begin by simply saying that to conflate publishing with literary publishing per se is a non-starter because publishing is a huge universe of categories um, that most people don't pay attention to. The press is mostly interested in literary and commercial fiction, but I think publishers can increase diversity and inclusion by um, advertising jobs in a multiplicity of categories and a multiplicity of functions. Um, so I echo what Lisa says, um, that along every aspect of the publishing chain, um, we should think about it reflecting America, reflecting how America looks. And right now, the emphasis is strictly on um, decision makers, and that should not be. If it's going to be on decision makers, it should be on decision makers in publicity, in marketing, in sales, and in the book selling community. Yeah. No, that's that's um, that's very true, and it and it is such a an enormous industry. Um, I'd like to, for a moment, sort of turn towards the, the very current moment we're existing in. And I think it is, I think we can agree that it's sort of a unique moment in time or a special moment right now, that in recent weeks, um, Black authors, including Isabel Wilkerson, Britt Bennett, Ibram Kendi, Kendi, and Michelle Alexander, amongst many others, have surged to the top of the bestseller list. and. I know we wish, all of us, we wish that this moment hadn't been brought on by this racial reckoning that took place in the aftermath of the murders of innocent Black people, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey. But does this moment actually feel different to you? And, and maybe, Errol, we can just keep going with you. Is this, does it still feel like, I mean, do you think this one's going to last? Does it feel like a moment? And what can white and Black publishing professionals do to sort of continue to sustain recognition of authors of color. So it's not just sort of a blip that, that winds down. It is a moment. And I don't believe it's an inflection in the history of publishing. Um, one remembers that books by black writers were hugely popular in the 60s and 70s in the, um, during the civil rights movement and um, during the Black Power Movement. Um, so, and that went away. Okay. Right now, we're at a moment where um, the narrative is still being defined to a certain degree by people in power. So that those books that are on the bestseller list are there mostly to educate whites. Okay, Whites have taken on um, these books as if they were a self-help program. Um, I believe that interest in these books will attenuate, but I do think that their appearance on the bestseller list has increased interest in acquiring more books like those among publishers. Yeah, okay. Um, and then Regina, why do you think that black stories sort of have been riskier bets recently than white stories. I'm talking in the more distant but recent past. And you know, like this isn't how it works in the music industry, for instance. What what can we do from your perspective or from the literary age's perspective to continue to change this? 
Oops, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Now I was just saying, wow, that's a big question. Um, there are a number of different ways that I can approach answering that question. I, I think the first thing um, echoes back to what was said before is it's very difficult for people to penetrate the marketplace if there is a lack of understanding of the content. So as a literary agent, one of the things that I've consistently asked um, editors is if you know that there's an audience for a book, and you know that um, the book is gonna sell, but the book is not necessarily something that you would read or you would go pick up in the bookstore, would you acquire that book? And more often than not, editors say, well, if it doesn't resonate with me and it's not a book that I feel like I can truly champion, then I'm not the best editor for that book. So there's a true understanding from an agent and editor standpoint why they may say that but that is a big hurdle because most of the people again that are in these positions of power to make decisions are white and that doesn't mean that white people can't enjoy books that are written by people of color but generally speaking that the, the people that they do raise up and and buy books from are celebrities that are people of color right right <laughs> And so that is one big obstacle. So it starts in the editorial side. Yeah. The other thing that I hear too is the fact that even if they were interested in buying the book, understanding how to position the book once it is acquired, that's a big issue. And what, we, what do we mean by position? Meaning how do we get it out into the marketplace so that the audience that is going to be interested in this book actually knows about it <laughs> and this is both in the children's young adult adult marketplace all of these all of the the different areas within publishing do we have issues and again staffing issues so if there were people in the sales department people in marketing people in publicity that were people of color there could be a lot more understanding of how that those books could be positioned Right. I was just on a call today, and I'll make this quick. I was just on a call today where I was talking to a marketing director and explaining that I'm okay with, at this point that you don't know how to position this book, but I'm here to stand in the gap. Yeah. I have my finger on the pulse of certain communities, and I want you to use me as an, an ally to help position some of these books. And, but there aren't a lot of people like me First of all, agents typically don't help with marketing. Right. And then, yeah, right. And then the second thing is when they do, the, the, the structure is not set up to allow agents to have that kind of access to the marketing department, to publicity departments. Right. It's mainly with the editors. So for instance, Nicole, since you had a solidly white team, as I understand it, right? Marketing, publicity, um, sales, et cetera. Who was helping you with that gap? I mean, did you have someone help in this second round, you know, with Patsy where you had, I mean, both of your books have been very successful, but, you know, was there something, did you have the equivalent of Regina to guide you through some of that? Yeah, I, my agent also did that as well. Um, somehow she stepped into that gap, but my, I had a really great publicist, Michael Tatens, who, um, you know, miraculously, I mean, he has his polls. I, I feel like he had his um, fingers on all the polls and I, I felt like, this time around, especially with Patsy, when no, more people knew who I was um, after Here Comes the Sun, um, I felt like I saw more folks um, coming on board. So where Here Comes the Sun, for example, you know, it, it wasn't on any Essence list or, um, you know, I, I was like, you know, where's, where's Ebony, where's Essence? Patsy fell on those lists, right? The, um, the pockets that I wanted um, my book to also hit, um, as, as well as the Jamaicans who um, who I wanted to read the book as well. They they also got Patsy. And I think that was, you know, for, for me, um, I think it was the audio book, I think, that did that. Um, because I had a Jamaican um, actress who read the, the audio book. And then I had um, this, all these, um, these the hits from Jamaicans saying, oh my gosh, we have to get the book as well. So all those things happened. I think, you know, it, multiple, multiple factors um, came into play. And I was really happy that all the stars were aligned. I mean, in the, in the publicity of the two books. 
That's great. I actually did listen to your book too, and it was wonderful reading. Um, so Lisa, in terms of you, like you've, you've obviously been credited with revitalizing the National Book Award and uh, Book Foundation and its annual award. And I think in 2008, um, Authors of Color swept all five categories. Is that right? 2008? 2018, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Didn't yeah. mean to add a decade to your work there. <laughs> um, but what was the, why do you think there's the disconnect between the recognition and the perception of marketability for authors of color? Well, I mean, I think back to a point that Errol made earlier, which is if you really want to facilitate change at the top, you need to think about marketing and you need to think about publicity, right? And so functionally, the National Book Awards is a publicity wing of books, right? Like we make noise about books. We try to serve readers. We are not publisher facing. We are not author facing. We are reader facing, right? and we are audience facing. And so our job is to really widen the audience for books, right? That's what we have worked to do. And I think that that's about the way that we build our panels, the way that we present our show, who we have as hosts, the different programs that we do, whether or not we're giving books to young people and families in public housing, or doing middle school programs for young readers, or we're selecting books about mass incarceration and coming up with, you know, interesting ways to get people to read those books so they know more about the carceral system um in this country you know these are all ways to connect reader and book um and i think that you know ultimately one of the reasons why we see some of the problems that we see is about a failure to imagine a different or new audience and i think that the foundation is nimble enough and small enough um that we can do that really easily right you know i can get a new job and say i think we can reach a bigger audience and somebody will put me on the news and i can say that and a funder will give us some money and we can just flexibly start doing that new program um and it's not as difficult to implement change i think on the publishing side where i have not yet been but will soon go gonna be soon. <laughs> yeah soon i mean i think one of the things is like it, you know there seems like such a resistance of people in publishing literary publishing as errol pointed out very wisely you know to think of what we sell as a commodity as a thing a commodity like we are making a transaction between consumer and seller and if you were apple right and you said you know it just seems like black people just don't like the ipad so we're just you know we're not going to sell them iPads, right? So we're just going to focus on who likes iPads and to sell them iPads. And, you know, with an ever increasing black population, we're just going to throw that money in the garbage and say, you know, not worth it. They don't like iPads. And that feels to me like a bit of what publishing has done. It said, we know that black folks will buy this kind of book um, that can guarantee us a sale and everything else. Ah, it's never going to happen. So, you know, maybe there's a shot in the pan or flash in the pan. I'm the worst at mixing metaphors, but um, there's a flash in the pan, you know, or whatever the expression is, um, you know, and this happened to be a big bestseller, but never will it ever happen again. So let's just move on and go back to selling your grandma in Iowa a book because we know she'll buy it. But the question for me is how did we get your grandma in Iowa to love books? How did we get her to know that she's going to like a very specific kind of book? That's market research, that's investment, that's building the audience, that's working on how to ensure that a community is consistently well served and that we involve our business to continue serving that cash cow that is that particular demographic segment of America. And in our continued refusal to actually consider that we might seek market share by doing more innovative business, I think that we do the greatest disservice we could possibly do to all of our black and brown communities in America, to our rural communities in America. You know, to audience. You know, I think that we really often fail on that front. And I think that that's just to me, the thing that I just keep coming back down to, which is like, do we like to sell things? Yes or no. Do we want to sell more things? Yes or no. Are there more people who have demonstrated again and again that we over-index on all cultural consumption? And do we wanna sell them things? Yes or no? Do we like stories, we people of color in America? Yes, we love film, we love podcasts, we love television, we love books too, you know? And how do you transfer that actual factual information into sales of a product? And that, insofar as I understand it, is our job. And I think that 
you know, it, we're just the, the continuation to sort of, you know, we we're talking earlier about all these books falling off the bestseller list. Our job is to keep them on the bestseller list, to continue pumping things into the reading population that actually doesn't face the white gaze consistently. We need to adjust our critical apparatus. We need to talk about the fact that there are very few black booksellers, very few Latino booksellers, very few indigenous booksellers, very few bookstores and communities that serve these communities. And so what do you do with that? It's like the whole thing is structured to look only at white people and it's a big, big ship. Yeah. And you have to really systematically look at where those points are where we are continually failing and adjust, not just for equity, not just for justice, but like at the very baseline, most cynical level for money. Yeah, yeah. Do any of the rest of you want to add something to what Lisa just said? It's so fascinating. I want to focus on the, um, the books that have been on the bestseller list. Um, these books on race and racism, because even those books, which are described as so-called black books, are in fact addressed to white readers. Okay? I haven't seen a lot of black people with how to be an anti-racist on the subways when it came out. Okay? I don't see a lot of black people re reading white fragility. Okay? So we have to understand that publishers need to broaden their understanding of what books matter to black people. No, no, absolutely. Anyone else? And I'd argue that we have to, as a country, decide that Black people matter before we can decide that Black folks deserve good culture. I mean, it's just the exclusionary history, you know, it is suppression. It's, it's you know, I think the thing is we use this language that is so soft, not even, I mean, even in harsh language, it's still so soft. This is cultural suppression. You know, there was the article that came out about the Criterion Collection this year and the conclusion of only four filmmakers that were black, two of them living, you know, in, in since the 1980s in an enormous collection of the best films on planet earth, right? And it's like the fact that those books have not been, can those books, those films have not been canonized, right? Have not been given the same treatment, mean that we are excluded from what is considered the best, right. you know? And it's like, and that that is suppression. That is, you know, when you think about, you know, Julie Dash and Daughters of the Dust, not to go off on the film tangent, you think about Just Another Girl on the IRT, and you think about, you know, so many of Spike Lee's films, and you think about all of these, you know, all of these incredible things that have shaped Black culture and shaped Black thought on the film side, and their actual exclusion, it, it disincentivizes participation, right? You don't, you know, you can't win, so why play? You know, it, it, it fails to educate the American population. Right? It just, there's so, but at the end, what it does is suppress our voices, our real voices. If we are not saying something that speaks to this gatekeeper, then it is not a value. And that person is able to articulate what value is through culture to everyone. And then we become devalued. So I think the dangerous nature of this sort of thing, I think that's the thing that people don't understand. I think that even people who are making these decisions don't understand that it's not just in equal. It's not just unjust. It is also a violence done to people who live in this country yeah, absolutely. of all kinds. And I mean, I, that might be slightly off tangent, but it's just like, I just feel sort of like, you know, we have to really understand that foundation about, you know, sort of being cynical about whether what black people will read, yeah. you know, and, 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 and artificially manufacturing a cultural landscape that suppresses the real black voice in so many different instances is part of what is destroying our country. Would you talk a little gonna, bit? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, I was just gonna say, you know, it's interesting that um, Errol is here because, you know, I was gonna say Toni Morrison brought me to literature and, you know, um, there were uh, times and times again, I'd watch her um, interviews or I'd read um, her essays. And, you know, she always said, you know, do not write for the white gaze, you know, write your stories and write it true to heart. And I feel like, you know, what Errol just said about the kinds of books that make bestseller lists, you know, it's like teaching white people. And, um, you know, I remember talking to a friend of mine, you know, because, you know, even though Patsy and Here Comes the Sun, they, they were critically acclaimed, um, I didn't get any awards, like, I mean, apart from Lambda. And, you know, it wasn't like a bestseller, like a runoff, like New York Times bestseller. So I was, I was like lamenting about that once, you know, I mean, you're, you're human. 
So I was like, oh my gosh, you know, that's interesting. And you know what she said to me? She's like, what would Toni Morrison say? And I was like, what she'll say? She'll, she doesn't give a shit, right? Because you're, you're an artist. You stay true to that art form and not, and not, and just hold your head down and write. And so I think that's very important. But at the same time, I do understand that, yes, you know, when I look up and I do see the, the books on the list, you know, I do see that pattern in a sense of, okay, so it's like, um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, not, I mean, I love, I love um, most of the people who are on that list, you know, they're friends, they're colleagues of mine. But yes, when you do look at the, um, the issues that, that's, a, that's written about, it tends to have that element in there. And so I wouldn't have even really given that, that much thought until, the, um, until um, Errol just said what he said. But I do, I do think it's, it's a lot of pressure on the artists sometimes, especially if you're a young artist, and you're wondering, I get this question all the time on the panels, you know, so what if we're writing and nobody wants to read what we write? You know, and I, I'll always tell them, just continue pushing, continue writing, and, you know, stay far from discussions like this one. I mean, this is a great discussion, but, you know, you don't want to worry your head like what people are going to latch on to, just write. Um, and so I guess, I guess from my perspective as an artist, um, you know, if any other artist is listening to this conversation, just write. I just hope that no, um, there are people in place, there are gatekeepers in place that's now going to hopefully listen um, to what we have to say. Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you're part of this conversation. <laughs> um, and before I realize that we're getting close to wanting to turn it over to the um, uh, audience Q&A, but I just, I wanted to um, ask one last question as sort of a, a stalwart optimist. And I'd like to know, you know, what, does give you hope about the industry these days? And are there things that really are, I mean, I think you have mentioned some, but are looking up that you feel hopeful about and that any of you can chime in on? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say one of the things that I'm really excited about is um, I'm a part of, I'm on the board of the Association of Author Representatives. Oh, am, I, am I on mute? No, nope, I'm here. <laughs> I'm on the board of the Association of Author Representatives. And um, we are doing quite a bit to try to bring more people of color into the agenting world because there's the, there are the gatekeepers within the publishing houses, but also in order to get into most of these mainstream publishing houses, you do need an agent. And a lot of times for people of color, it can be difficult getting um, an agent. And just being an agent is a very difficult thing too because of the way the business model is set up. So not too many people of color are able to live in New York City, and fortunately that's shifting, <laughs> um, yeah. and be in a, um, where their salary is set up based on you eat what you kill. So as, a, as an agent, I get 15% of the monies that my authors get for an advance, and that's my commission. And so, you mentioned earlier the publishing paid me hashtag. So as an agent, if I'm working with clients that are black, I mean, I have a combination, but if I'm working with black authors who are, whose work is being devalued and we're getting only a small percentage, it's a very difficult um, business to be in. But there's a lot of changes that are um, being addressed in that market, that part of the business. And I'm super excited to be at the, um, uh, one of the people who was helping to make some of those shifts. So, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. What, one of one of the things that excites me, or there are two things that excite me. One is that there appears to be a generational shift in the publishing industry. Um, I was really heartened by the attempted insurrection by some young people recently um, in the making certain demands of publishers. And I think, um, I think it's not unhealthy that an older generation, which adhere to certain narratives, I don't think it's unhealthy that that generation might be dying out. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'd agree. I would say that I think the thing that gives me the most optimism is not necessarily the older generation leaving, but the new generation coming in. I mean, it's like, I think, I, you know, and I think I sit, you know, I'm 20 years into a career, you know, hopefully a while left to go, you know, so kind of happily in the middle. Um, but you look at 
but I came up the way I came up. I had to change the way that I spoke or dressed or acted or what I said and the things that I accepted, you know, that I feel ashamed of now, you know, in many cases, you know, they're mm -hmm. growing up believing this to be unacceptable. The narrative is different for them. The, 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 the larger landscape is different for them. And so even things that I, as a pretty outspoken, enraged person feel and think and do, they are so much more radical than I could ever dream of being. And I just can't wait, you know? And I think that that's, you know, the thing that I can give, you know, is to, you know, I've had many mentors, um, many of them from the old guard, you know, I, I lost one who was more of a model than a role model than a technical mentor, but, you know, um, to, to, to try and really seek out young people who can change this, you know, I can, and to give them whatever information or context you know, or contacts I have to empower them so that, that as they stage, you know, their great shakeup of the cultural world, that they have all the tools they could possibly have. And you know what, at one point, they're gonna say, Lisa, you're too conservative. You're not doing enough. You're not changing fast enough. And I welcome it, you know, because they deserve the power to actually be able to make this world a little bit more just. And, um, and I think that I grew up in a different world. You know, I was born in 1980. You know, I went to high school in the 90s, and I think it must be so different and still very frustrating in 2020 to be that age. But I think that we do have the opportunity to change a few things. And I think that the book, the book, I think that people have demonstrated that they still value the book. I wish more people did, right? But it's like, but people think about the book. The news cares about the book again a little more than it did maybe 10 years ago. And I think that that intersection of young people who care about literature, No Name, for instance, um, the rapper from Chicago who's incredible, right? Who's taken a deep, deep and profound interest of in getting books into prisons and to talking about anti-capitalist books and sh doing a book club and really thinking about who we're speaking to and, you know, being spoken to by, you know, it's like, I wanna see, you know, what that looks like. And I'm just really excited for that future. You know, and it may not even include me in the degree that I would like it to, and that's okay. Well, I think we have lots to thank the four of you for about uh, the the resurgence of the book. Um, I am going to look at these questions that are in the chat line and ask you some of these. So here we go. Libraries are part of the larger book ecosystem and collectively have huge, have significant buying power. How can library staff advocate for and push for change in the publishing industry? How can library staff advocate for and push for change, oh, same thing, sorry, in the publishing industry? Any thoughts there? I mean, I think it's the same role in many ways as a bookseller. Do you know what I mean? You have a community of people coming in who want to participate in the book, right? And so what your shelves look like, what you are, what you are, what you are buying many copies of, how you are presenting them, the programs that you run around those books, those are all going to speak to how welcome someone is or isn't in that space. And I think that that's the place to start. Who is this space for? You know, who are we creating these spaces for? And I think that when you actually design spaces with the real community in mind and, and a real openness to what that community might want to receive culturally, I think that you start a conversation, you know, and I mean, librarians are doing God's work. I mean, yeah, honestly, you know, so it's like, I don't have a whole lot of like critique for the library community um, on the diversity issue because it's like, that's, you know, ground zero for like where right. people go to get books. So it's like, I love the librarians, but I think that you do walk into libraries sometime and you say, who is this like set up for? You know, who did this? And then to continue to sort of like, if you were a senior librarian, like nurture young staff, you know, and empower them. Young people know, you know, they know more than we give them credit for and we've got to let them, and they're, they are living, they are building a more equitable world. So I think that, you know, sharing power when you have two generations that are doing two totally different, or having two different conversations about equity, I think we have to allow young people who are far more progressive on these issues, you know, to, to, to to rise, to, to do things on their own independently. And I think that that often builds a lot of um, equity in spaces as well. But, you know, but again, I love the libraries very much and I don't really have right. a whole lot to critique them on. No, and I think mentorship is just one of the big takeaways from this talk of all. Um, we have another uh, question from Erica Turnipseed, who's a writer. What other activism needs to happen in order to throw back the curtain on these other jobs within publishing? 
I don't know that there's much to, to add beyond what we've already said, or do you have something, Regina? You were... Well, I, I, I really do feel like it would be super advantageous to have, and I don't want to be redundant, but to create, to, to do something with the Publishing Institute, because you can talk about all of the different positions that are available um, mm. within the industry. I think that having people come in and talk to young people about what opportunities exist is the main, it's it, a lot of it is just access and knowledge and being able to see it. Yeah, so I, I agree with that just quickly. Just quickly, I, just quickly, I want to say, look, I've worked at uh, I've worked at nonprofits for 19 years. I have never worked at a publisher, right? That is not what I've done. I still can't make heads or tails of who does what at the Knopf Doubleday Publishing Group. I'm trying to figure out at night from the internet on Zoom how many people work there, who does what, you know, <laughs> who works on which imprint and what and how it all works together. It's totally obscure. Like, it's totally opaque. There's no <laughs> way to figure it out from outside. And I literally have the job. Yeah. You know, no. so, so if I can't figure out what in the world, then how would anyone else? And then how do you even start to address those issues when there's just absolutely no transparency about how it works? I mean, it's just like, I, I, I am, I am, I have to say that I was like a little bit flabbergasted. Like, I'm sorry, who does what, where, okay, wait, how does this work? You know, it's all very, and it's like that, it, it's like that internally and externally, like, how long does it, I mean, how many times do I have to explain what a literary agent actually does? I right. mean, <laughs> and then there are multiple ways that a literary agents approach the business. So it is, mm -hmm. it is very, very non-transparent. I mean, I tell you, I'm like flabber, I, I just am speechless at just how little I actually know and how hard it is to figure out, you know, what like, and it's not because people don't want to tell you, it's not that kind of thing. It's just, it's just very complex and there's nothing that you can, read or download that's going to be like oh cool got it got it got it this is exactly how this works and these are the jobs and this is what needs to happen i think there and i errol made this point earlier that we need to to, to really do a job of talking about what our industry actually is yeah. for not just ourselves not just for future staff but just so that people know how books are made they are too right. important you know it's like you know dance like dance organizations have classes in schools to explain what dance is to the people imagine imagine if dance was like oh we're like books and every child needs us to learn how to read you know we have such access this is such a big part of everyone's life and the fact that they truly are like these magical objects that we don't really understand how they're made or where they come from is really concerning and i think that that you know that disincentivizes the, people wanting to with, work but even within the publishing industry, when you, if you were to ask five different editors, how do you do, how do you build a book? You're going to get five different answers. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Right. Just in working for different places. I mean, <laughs> yeah. design is- But some things are just fundamentals. And I think even that is really challenging. And I think that like, why would you ever want to grow up and be a book jacket designer if you don't know how that works or that those jobs exist? You know, it's difficult. It sounds like we should be inviting any of the big five publishers who are watching to um, to support uh, the reinvigoration of Howard's program. <laughs> It'd be helpful. All right, um, let me read another question. Michael Julius e. Idani, who's an author, what can be done to make public pursuing publishing careers accessible to passionate and talented first generation college graduates and those from working class backgrounds who may also have to contribute to supporting their families? And it's mm -hmm. from, he's from the Iowa White Writers Workshop. I mean, yeah. Errol? I can it to Errol. Um, I think that um, the industry is, is going to be changing dramatically as a result of COVID-19. Yeah. I, um, I think it's going to change in ways that we can't even imagine. Um, I think working at home is going to become prevalent for certain functions. And I think that might open um, the door to some constituencies that heretofore have not felt publishing to be attractive. So um, I don't know that definitive pronouncements can be made right now about 
how to bring people in, but I, know, I do know that the industry is changing dramatically and people should keep their eyes out, keep their eyes open for opportunity. And in fact, um, because of the pandemic, I have um, a fellow who's working in, from Belgium, and I also have someone who's in Washington, D.C., and I also have an agent right now who's in um, San Diego. So I know that from an agenting perspective, there is definitely going to be much more openness to people working remote. And I'm internally building a system so that I can educate people about the agenting business and how to become an agent, even if they're not on site. Yeah, that, that is great. I feel like this, um, you know, what we've learned from this situation that we're all figuring out how to work in, in other places than New York and less expensive places than New York. Um, the final question is so long and very complicated and I, I've been reading it and still haven't quite found the question. So I think I'm gonna go back to something that we talked about a little bit yesterday, which has to do with language and the language surrounding some of our goals, uh, the goals in publishing to be more inclusive. And Lisa, you talked a little bit about it, but, but a bit about the language of supremacy, but about how to, how to make things more inclusive on that particular level. Is that something you'd wanna speak I to? I mean, I think it's just like, right, you know, lately I've been reading a lot about the changing of the guard for obvious reasons. <laughs> and, you know, and people talking about what we need to do in publishing and, and, um, and, and the we that they are using is not the we that includes me. Yeah. You know, and I think that that is like, I think that when we talk about, you know, if we're talking about America's literature, right? The world's literature, right? And so when we are saying us and them, you know, it's up to us to do this, to make sure they feel this way. This is, there's no, the, 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 it, it's, we failed. It's over. It's like, we're, we're still, we still haven't started the conversation. Yeah. And I think that we have to learn how to, you know, on that level, talk in language that actually acknowledges that the table is shared, as opposed to I'm going to give you a seat at my table. Right? right. It is the table and we must speak about it as such. And then I think secondarily, I think that we, industry wide, because there is, you know, a majority and a very small minority, you know, that majority talks about books by the other, you know, as though it is the other. How can you sell that? How can you, un you're not selling to another community. We are all one community. And I just don't understand, you know, some of the words that I hear or read in the newspaper or that people say to me in discussions on panels and how othered I feel, not because of my feelings are hurt, my feelings aren't hurt, I've been called worse. Worse things have been said to me, worse things have been done to me. But because it just seems that the point has not been taken, this very loud, very moral, very clear point that has been made over and over and over and over again for decades. And the fact that we, with our language, betray that we still don't understand the very fundamentals of working in an us, and them environment means that you still believe yourself to be supreme, which you are in fact not. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that we have to appreciate is how the very language of diversity and inclusion is itself problematic because it is, it is a master narrative. Right. Yes. Who is doing the diversifying and yep. for what? Who is doing the including and for what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it's all what is more often left out of that language is one word, which is equity. Okay? Diversity, inclusion, and equity. Okay? And publishers mm -hmm. have had a hard time with that E word. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can't find the lie, <laughs> as they say. Well, I think that is a wonderful note to and the questions on. I think Vivian is gonna be coming back in. Um, it's four o'clock, but I wanna thank you all so much for participating, for lending your voices, for being a part of this discussion. And um, it's, been, it's been really wonderful and educational and helpful. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us.
Thank you, everyone. That was such an incredibly powerful um, conversation. So uh, Lisa, Errol, Regina, and Nicole, thank you so much. Adrian and Aspen Words, so grateful for your moderating. I also want to thank Dominique Harrison, who has designed these, uh, th this entire series about looking at media through the lens of race, and our producer, Beth Semmel. The video will be posted uh, either later tonight or tomorrow. You can find it on Aspen, at Aspen Digital. We'll have the link on our, our Twitter account. And uh, for those of you that registered, we'll also email it to you. Thank you so much, everybody, and we'll see you next time.